Hello, hello, good afternoon. So good to be able to come back to you all once again. I wanted to just come on and encourage your hearts on today. And I excuse, excuse me for the lateness uh, of the hour, but it's been a very busy day for me. I want to just give a quick shout out to all of my church family um, at New Life Tabernacle Church of God in Christ. Thank you, thank you, thank you so very much for all of you who came on and joined me on this morning as I taught this lesson that I'm going to share with others today on relationship repair. I decided to redo the video because as I went back and looked at what we did this morning, there was a lot of noise. There was a lot of background noise. Uh, there were some people that contacted me after the workshop was over asking for the recording um, and then asking if I could share additional information with them in regards to the topic. And so I want to jump on and share with you what I was able to share with the women on this morning. I pray that this word would be a blessing to you as it was most definitely a blessing to me and to others. So I'm going to talk, we're going to be talking today about uh, relationship, re relationship repair, repairing relationships. And as we talk about repairing relationships, this is something that a tool, a, a teaching tool that we'll need throughout the course of life. Because as we transition through life, there's going to be people that come and go. There's going to be life events that's going to transpire along the way. And we have to be properly equip equipped and made aware on how to handle these relationships so that we can deal with less pain and trauma in our lives, but be able to react to it in the way that God designed for us to. And that's to respond to it with rejoicing, respond to it with thanksgiving, knowing that that trial will not last always. And so I want to go in and jump in and just share this with the rest of you all that weren't able to join or those of you that didn't even know that the teaching was going on on this morning. Just praying that it blesses your soul. So we're we, what I talk, taught on this morning is recovering from failing marriages, fractured friendships, and wounded fellowship. Now, I want to bring this out in a little bit of a different way because... We all have relationships that we're in, even with family and co-workers, that can be addressed in this same topic. And so when, we, when I look at the word recovering, the meaning of that word means to return to a normal state of health, mind, or strength, to find or regain possession of. Now, I would like to point out that the meaning of this word lets us know that we are in process of. And we are really in process of in every area of our lives, not just when we experience, experience trauma, not just when we experience pain, but as we transition through life and as life happens, whether we have to change jobs, move from one dwelling place to another, marry, have babies, or whatever, whatever the case may be, we're going to always be in the process of, and that of is transitioning. It does, this word does not implicate, and nor does it mean that we are over the trauma or the pain of what's happened in our lives, over that grief. It doesn't mean that we're done with it or better yet. It doesn't mean that. But sometimes we can mistake the recovering process to mean that we're all good. And when we're in that place of recovering, even though we're in a better place than we were when the trauma first started, it doesn't mean that we're over what we have to could go through yet. This word simply means that we are transitioning through a process of becoming well again. When we look at becoming, Becoming means to pass from one state to another by assuming or receiving new qualities or a new character. These traumatic experiences of disappointment, potential loss from, from failing relationships, from broken relationships can sometimes be difficult for us to see the true value and the beauty that is hidden within us. 
it is sometimes difficult to see what's hidden because the pain from what's happened to us has become a distraction. And that pain comes to blind us. It, it doesn't come for that purpose, but that pain will blind us from allowing us to, uh, from seeing what God is doing in our lives. It'll blind us from seeing what he has truly placed on the inside of us. Do you not know that when we are suffering and going through pain and grief and disappointment, when we're going through transition in life, do you not know that that pain, the word of God says that uh, trials come to make us strong. And I'm finding now as I'm growing older that that is an absolute truth. Pain comes and trial comes to make us stronger. And a lot of times God puts us through testing so that he can see exactly what we are made of. He wants to see if we are going to, you know, let me let me say this. When we are raising children, as they get older and they're preparing to go out into life on their own, I know we as mothers, we have a fear because we wonder, you know, are they going to glean from what we have? Are, are, are they going to glean from what we have taught them? Are they going to be able to take the tools that we have given them as we taught them from a child up? And are they going to be able to take those tools and go out into the world and survive? And that is kind of the same thing that God does to us when he's transitioning us, transitioning us through the course of life. He wants to know, are they going to be able to pull up that word that I've placed in them to help them to overcome? Are they going to be able to go out here when the enemy tries to beat them down, steal their joy, tear up what he's what he's given them when he comes to try to steal the blessings that I've placed in their life? Are they going to be able to use the tools that I've given them to fight back? Are they going to be made known and aware that it is in me that they have been made strong? Glory to God. Are they going to be able to use those tools? And when we're going through pain and trauma and transition, we've got to dig in our arsenal, in our, in our tool belt, and pull out those tools that God has given us. We've got to make sure that we have on that whole arm of God. We've got to make sure that we have on that helmet of salvation, that belt, that, 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 that uh, breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth. We've got to make sure that the preparation of peace is on our feet, that the sword of the spirit is in our right hand and the shield of faith in our left. And we most definitely got to make sure that the garment is, of praise is covering us because the word of God says that praise is our weapon. No matter what comes to us, he tells us that praise is our weapon. Praise is a weapon that we've got to use and use it faithfully. It is sometimes difficult to see what's hidden in us because of the pain. In our process of recovery, it is very critical that you allow yourself permission to evolve and become the new authentic version of you. We look at ourselves and listen to others' perception of us, thinking that who we see in the mirror when we look at ourselves, we think that this is who we are. But God has placed so much beauty, so much wisdom, so much creativity within us that we have not yet become all that God has created us to be. We are continually evolving into that divine creature that God originally designed for us to be. The pain that we experience from grief of what we are going through in our life's battles in those failing and loss of relationships. It is just the tool. It is only the tool and the vehicle that God is using to transport you to that destined place. You say, well, Lisa, what's that destined place? That destined place is a place of rebirthing and new. I'm not talking about the word A, two words, A space N-E-W. I'm talking about one word, A-N-E-W, a new, which that is part of what uh, the, the ministry that God gave me, B2B, Broken to Birth, is all about. It's about rebirthing anew. It's about Broken to Birth came about 
because of what God took me through and what he taught me through the process. That it is in the time of trial, the time of disappointment, the time of grief. It is in the time of pain and tragedy and trauma that he uses those as tools to birth us anew. And when he births us anew, we get to a place where we recognize and understand that we need him more than ever. But he also knows that we don't recognize that we need him until he shows us that he is all that we have. And it is in that knowing and that awakening of knowing that we need him more than ever and he is truly all that we need where he begins to break our hearts the more and he breaks our hearts the more so that we can yield our whole bodies mind soul spirit and will to him and in the process of that he exchanges this old wicked stony heart that we have and he gives us his heart in exchange and not only does he bless us and give us his heart, but he puts his spirit down on the inside of us and it makes us anew, anew in him, a new version of ourselves that we've never known before, a new version of ourselves that we've never seen before, a new transformation in us that we didn't even know or realize could exist because that's the power of the mighty God's hands that we serve. That is the power of the, the, of the living God that we serve because he's a good father and he loves us so much that he doesn't want us to stay in that place we're in and remain the same. So when he's rebirthing us anew, he does it in a new and a different way. He does it all over again. The, 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 the guy in the Bible that, that came to Jesus and asked him, he wanted the same power that Jesus had. And, and God told him, you know, this power I can't give to you. You got to go through and you got to suffer to receive what I have. Glory to God. You got to go through and to receive what I have. And then I remember the man asking him, well, the God told him, Jesus told him, well, you have to be born again. He said, how can I be born again? How to, can I enter again in my mother's womb? The carnal, the things of the carnal, the things of God cannot be understood by the things of the carnal natural mind. How are we born again? We're born again when we give God all that we are and say, Lord, here I am. Take me as broken as I am. I give it all to you because what I've done in the past is not working. And I know that without your help, I won't make it. And we give him access by saying yes to whatever your will and your perfect plan is for my life. And you do with it as you choose. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And when we do it on that, when we do it that way and we yield all that we are to him, we give him free access to do a new thing on the inside of us to make us anew, to rebirth something in us, oh God, that we've never had before. Glory to God. He cannot rebuild you in the same way. You can't go back to the same way that you used to be. You got to get to a point to where you're tired of being the same as you've been. You got to lay it all on the altar. They used to say that back in the day when we were growing up. Have you laid it all on the altar? Lay it on the altar. So I come and I get in prayer and I bow my knees and I say, Lord, I'm placing myself on the coals of your altar. Burn me away. And when I'm telling him to burn me away, burn away everything in me that you can't use. Burn away everything in me that don't bring you glory. Burn away everything in me that's not going to edify you. Burn away everything in me that's going to exalt, cause me to exalt myself and esteem myself higher than others. Burn away what's not going to make Lisa perfected in righteousness and holiness in you. Burn it away. I give you access to burn it away. A lot of times we desperately desire for the pain of what we experience to be over and done with. Because it seems so unbearable that we just have to have that relief. We need instant relief. And sometimes when we need instant relief like that, God doesn't always come and just take the pain away. Hallelujah. But like my brother used to say all the time, glory to God. He'll take the sting out of the hurt. 
And when he takes that sting out of the hurt, it don't hurt as bad. And it reminds me of the example of a bee. When a bee comes and it bites you, he puts his sting in your flesh. And when that sting goes deep into your skin, it burns and it hurts excruciatingly bad. And it's not until you take that sting out of your out of your out of your skin that the pain starts to subside. And sometimes we can't ask God to take away the pain because the pain is necessary to get us to that next destination. But we say, Lord, take the sting out of the hurt. Hallelujah. And he will do it. He'll do it. So oftentimes what we'll do is we'll mask the pain. We'll bury it. We'll shove it to the side. And we'll say to us, we'll have that mentality out of sight, out of mind. As long as I can't see it, can't touch it, I don't have to deal with it. Let me put it back there and, and sweep it under the rug. But we don't really realize that when we do that, that's the, 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 the trauma and the situation that we don't want to deal with. The pain of what's going on in our hearts is not going away. Just because we don't see it and choose not to deal with it from day to day doesn't mean that it's not going away. So rather than dig our heels into those emotions that we feel and deal with them head on, the danger of having the mentality of thinking out of sight, out of mind, is that you make the conscious decision to withdraw yourself from dealing with a part of your life which causes further pain and trauma in the years to come. So you, because you're making the choice not to deal with it now, it's going to cause you more pain, more trauma, and more grief later on. That's why it's so important to deal with it now. Take it head on and do with it what needs to be done. So what you're doing is you're just suppressing what you don't want to deal with. You're suppressing it until a later date. But I will assure you that it will resurface later. We cry out, Lord, heal me. Take this away. 3 John 1 verses 2 says, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper. And be in good health, even as thy soul prospers. So God lets us know in this scripture that he wants our lives as well as our mind, our heart, our soul, and bodies to be healthy and whole. He wants us to be healthy and whole. I want you to know that God wants to heal every part of you. He wants to heal every part of you. He wants to make you well again. There are times when God will not pluck you up, pluck you up from that place of trauma, that place of pain. He will allow you to remain in that place of pain, if only for a season. And while you're there, he will provide you with the grace that you need to endure. And the reason why he won't pluck you up out of that place of pain at that time for that season is because it is in that season where he needs to, to purge you, to purify you, to develop you, to train you, and to use what you're going through to help you to grow. Not just grow naturally so, but to grow physically, physically or psychologically. To help you to grow spiritually. Especially when he's in the reconstructing and mending things back together. The disclaimer here is that it may not be the relationship that gets mended. But is undoubtedly in the process of mending you. God may not always mend that relationship that you want him to mend. But even if he doesn't, you have to know and understand that in the process of what you're going through. God is undoubtedly mending you in the process. The pain is what, see, after we talk about this disclaimer, this disclaimer, trauma doesn't happen to us, but it happens for us. Because the pain is what produces the pressing. The pressing is what allows the pruning. The pruning produces the burning and the burning causes the purifying. And it is the purifying which allows healing to take place and development to begin. 
God uses our pain as a tool to transport us to that our destined place. Now, I want you to understand that nothing that you're going through is going to be wasted. The scriptural evidence for that statement is found in John chapter 6, verse 12. It says, when everyone was satisfied, Jesus told his disciples, now go back and gather up the pieces that are left over so that nothing will be wasted. He continued in verse 13 and said, the disciples filled up seven baskets of fragments. And what this scripture tells me is that there were seven bas baskets of fragments of food that were left over. And Jesus was going to use the fragments of the leftover food to feed another multitude of people. And if God can still use the fragments of five fish, both two fish and five loaves of bread that was left over that fed the masses, how much more will he use the fragments of our broken lives to rebuild us, to restore us and make us anew? He will not allow the fragments of your life to remain broken and scattered. God will take those fragments of your life. He will pick them up and use it all to transform you into who he originally created you to be. What am I talking about? He'll use those fragments to create the authentic version of you. We have not all yet arrived to that destined divine creature that God ordained for us to be. Why? Because we are evolving every day. That authentic version of you that you have not yet met yet. You look in the mirror and God is doing some awesome and amazing things in your life, in your family, in your finances. And yet you have still not seen the greatest of what God desires to do in you. He uses it all for good and for his divine glory. This is. You know, as we're going through this process, we come to another place that I like to call the valley of decision. And when we come to this valley of decision, this is a mental place where God sits us down. He ministers to our heart. He ministers to our heart and mind about our options. And he allows us to choose which path that we're going to take. We have to be careful in our choosing. Because we don't want to allow this place of decision to interrupt our relationship and wound our fellowship with God. We don't want this valley of decision to mess up our relationship with God because we have decided to make the wrong choice. God loves us no matter what we do and no matter what we go through. He can always be counted on to remain faithful. God is a good father, and he's the kind of father that will lead you, guide you, and show you the way that you should go. But I have to let you know that the decision is left up to you to choose the path that you'll take. That's going to be your choice. But know, know this, your decision is left up to you. To follow the path that Jesus has designed for you. And it is going to take your willingness to yield to his authority and humble yourself to his instructions. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 6 in the message version. It reads, trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. Listen for God's voice in everything that you do. Listen to his voice everywhere you go. He's the one who will keep you on track. Don't assume that you know it all. Run to God. Run from evil. And the word of God says that when you do that, he says that your body will glow with health. Your very bones will vibrate with life. Honor God with everything you own. And I'm not talking about honor him with the things that you own, like your house and your car, your clothes. I'm not talking about those kinds of things. You honor him with that, of course, yes. But I'm talking about honoring him with your heart, 
Honor him with your thoughts and your mind. Honor him in what you allow your eyes to see. Honor him with what you allow your ears to hear. Honor him with what you allow your mouth and your voice to speak. Honor him on where you decide to allow your feet to tread and where you go. Honor him. Give him your very best. And when you do, your barns will burst, your vine vats will brim over. But don't, my dear friends, resent God's discipline. Don't sulk under his loving correction. Why? Because the word of God says that it is his child that he loves. He, the, he loves us and he will correct us. And it is his delight behind everything that he does. Romans 8 and 28. So we are convinced that every detail of our lives is continually woven together to fit into God's perfect plan of bringing good into our lives. For we are his lovers who have been called to fulfill his design purpose. What is his purpose? God's purpose and divine plan is woven into all the pain, the disappointment, the grief, the hurt that we go through to produce his perfect work within us. That's his divine plan. His divine plan that we become his mind, body, soul, and will. And then that we yield all that we are, give our hearts totally to him so that he can perfect in us his divine plan for us to walk out on this earth in the building of his kingdom. That may be ministering to your next door neighbor. That may be giving a good word of encouragement to your coworker. That could be going to feed the hungry. It could be calling that family member on the phone that you've been feuding with and fell out a relationship with and tell them, look, I'm sorry. Even if you didn't do nothing wrong, sometimes it's best for us to do that to keep the peace. I want you to know that, you know what, I love you. And no matter what goes on in our life, I just want you to know that I'm here for you and I love you no matter what. Our purpose and plan can look like anything. It don't have to be on a pulpit in a church, standing on a street corner with a microphone in our hands. Our best ministry work is done outside the church. Where we're ministering to those in the world that are lost, those that are broken. Those that are hurting, especially during this time of pandemic right now. Once you make it through the valley of decision, God offers you an opportunity. And the opportunity that he offers you is called what I like to call the free exchange. During this place of free exchange, all God asks for and all he wants from us is a willing mind. A yielded, surrendered heart and your sincere yes to whatever he wants to do within you. That's all he's asking for. And that's all he needs from us. He needs that and our obedience. When you open up your whole heart to this free exchange, he will take the ashes from your pain and exchange it for beauty. Giving you beauty for ashes. That will transform you into his beautiful masterpiece. Then I want to take a look at the word repair. Repair is a, is, means the action of fixing or mending something. In the process of restoration, reconstruction, or rebuilding. But the word repair can also mean irreparable. Now, I want to bring out both versions of the meaning of that word because it's crucial to the different things and relationships that we go through in life. Now, I do believe that most failing relationships can be mended or repaired if you have both parties that want to make it work. And if you have both parties that are willing to put forth the work to rebuild it. Attempting to rebuild a relationship alone makes it impossible to restore what was damaged. It takes communication. It takes vulnerability on both parties. It takes sacrifice. The sacrifice of one's own self. 
You got to sacrifice what you think you need and want to compromise with what that partner needs and desires, what the, he needs and wants. Even in that friendship relationship, it takes self-sacrifice. It takes work and it takes time to rebuild. It takes time to rebuild a relationship that's been fractured. You must have a partner or a friend that is willing to put in the time and effort in order to rebuild that failing relationship. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6, he says, if you bow low, bow low in God's presence, he will eventually exalt you as you have as you have as you leave the timing in his hand. When we bow low to God, bow low means that we're bowing in humble submission unto God's authority. And when we bow low, we give him, we, he gives us the access to come into his presence. And he said that when we do that, he will exalt us. And, and we have to leave the timing of when he does that in his hand. We cannot move the hand of God. We cannot tell him what to do, when to do, or how to do it. We have got to wait on him. And we have got to wait patiently. You know why? I often ask the Lord, Lord, teach me how to wait on you because you waited on me so patiently for so long. And I want to wait patiently on you. When I feel a little bit anxious, Lord, teach me how to wait. Hallelujah. When I don't understand what's going on, Father God, in my life and what's around me, Lord, teach me how to wait on you. Because I, I don't want to be in your perfect will. I, I mean, I'm sorry. I don't want to be in your permissive will for my life. I want your perfect will for my life. And if I've got to wait for that perfect will to take place, Lord, teach me how to wait. Thank you, Lord God. When we are in suffering, we are convinced that it will never end. When we're in the midst of that pain and that grief, we don't think that it'll ever end because we can't see what's down the road. That pain has our eyes darkened and blinded to what God has ahead of us. But God is in the business of restoring. For his word is written in 1 Peter 5 and 10. He says, and then after your brief suffering, the God of all love and grace, who has called you to share in his eternal glory in Christ, will personally and powerfully restore you and make you stronger than ever. So the strength that you thought you had before, God said in his word, he's going to make you even stronger than that. Because remember, trials come to make us strong. And the grace of God will strengthen us and make us stronger through the trauma, stronger through the process, stronger through the pain than we've ever been before. If we wait on him and stay in that place of process that he has us in. He says that, yes, he will set you firmly in place and build you up. But you must remember. This is my words, not the scripture right now. And I'm telling you, you must remember that it is in God's timing. What he's doing in you and what you want him to do in you. And what you want him to do for you is in his timing. And we have to wait on him to move. Now, this word repair shows us that it is also a process. And while you are in the process of working on your personal recovery, or repairing that which was damaged and broken. It can also fall into a state of being irreparable. There are times when a relationship of any kind can become so damaged and broken that it cannot be repaired. We have to be prayerful and mindful that we don't allow the offense that has occurred with these failing relationships with spouses, friends, or family even co-workers, to cause us to develop a self-righteous spirit. When you say, Lisa, what are you talking about? How is me uh, dealing with the person's offense going to make me self-righteous? Let me tell you how. This, you know, developing a self-righteous spirit happens when we continually allow our minds to focus and replay that offense 
We allow that replay to keep going on in our minds and we keep meditating on that offense in our hearts. And when we do that, that, that we call that spirit causes our minds to belittle that person that offended us. And then we exalt ourselves above them. And when we exalt ourselves above them, this places us in God's eyes as an idol. And we know that God will not have allowed no other God to be before him. This places us as an idol before God. So we have to stay in a place of repentance. We have to stay in this place of repentance doing offense. Whether we were wronged by others or if we were the offender. A lot of times it's not all about how the other person offended us, but what did we do? Did we respond to that offense correctly? Did we go and take it to God in prayer and leave it there? Or are we still walking around one year, two years, five years later, still mad and angry and holding a grudge when that person is going on with their lives and ain't thinking about what you what you thinking about? Having a self-righteous spirit. We stay in a place of repentance. Even if we are the offender. So that we do not walk in a self-righteous spirit. Why? Because God despises it. If the relationship. If the relationship is irreparable. We have to become consciously aware of the sign. We've got to see those red flags and listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit when we pray. Because the Holy Spirit will sometimes tell us to know them that labor among you. And when he does that, there's something about that person he wants you to see and know. So make sure you listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit. So first we repent, ask for God's forgiveness for the offense that we've done to others. And for even allowing our heart to take that offense in the wrong, it take that offense to cause us to, to belittle them in our minds and in our hearts. We stay repentant. We take it to God in prayer, number two. And then number three, we have to be willing to let go. Not just to let go of the person, but to let go of the offense. Why? The word of God says to love those that despitefully use you. A lot of times people can mess over you and, and, and make offense over you and they don't even know you know because you're not saying nothing about it. But that's the way we are supposed to be. Take everything to the Lord in prayer. But it's also wise to go to that person, talk to them, find out what's going on. And if that relationship can be mended, work on mending it. It's just going to take two people to, 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 to do that, to make it happen. So after the, after the Holy Spirit reveals his truth to you of that person, we have to realize and understand that if, if, if that relationship is irre, 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 uh, irreparable, we have to make sure and realize that we understand that the season of that relationship has ended. And now we have to allow God to allow him to have his healing to take place in our hearts and in our minds. God has ordained a specific plan and path for us to take. And he put this plan in place before we were conceived and birthed in our mother's womb into this world. So there's absolutely nothing that we will go through in this life that God has not designed or allowed to take place. He has his own reasons why he allowed things to happen. But he doesn't do it <coughs> without an agenda. He uses both the good, the bad, the happy and sad to lead and direct us in the path that we should go. God takes all of this and he uses it to shape us into the divine vessels that he originally created us to be. Now, there are some times that we will lose our way. And when we lose our way, God is still faithful. And he will always redirect us back on the path that we should take. He'll put us back on that road that we veered off from. But we have to remember that it's our choice to stay on that creative path that he has designed for us. He's not going to make us do it. It has to be our choice. Because God is so rich in mercy and grace. If we allow him, he picks 
us up, places us back on the right path. Leading and guiding us toward our destined place in him. He redirects us at the same time that he's working on reconstructing our relationship and repairing our wounds. You see, we meet people, we get acquainted with them and attach ourselves to them along this route, along our life's journey. But we fail to realize sometimes that not everyone that we choose to do life with may not be the same people that God has ordained to walk with us for the long haul. Of course, we don't always know that. We don't always know that until after God begins to shift our lives. Through the transition of the trauma and pain that we're going through, God transitions our lives. And when he transitions us and shifts us, we have no control over what he does. Remember, I told you a little bit earlier that we're in the process of purging and puring and purifying and burning away. And there's also a process in there that I did not mention. And that is a process of tearing away. While you're going through all of that, God is tearing away things out of you that, that that's not that's not going to help you to grow. He's cutting away those branches that's bearing, uh, uh, that's naked without bearing any fruit. He's cutting away those branches that have fruit that have dried up, withered away, and died because it does. It's not going to produce you any growth. And as he's cutting those things away, he'll cut out obstacles out of your way. He'll cut situations out of your way. He'll cut your bad attitude away. He'll tear away people out of your life. But while he's doing that tearing away, he's such a merciful and a gracious God that he'll tear those things that he is tearing away. He'll bring something new in replace of it. We have no control of that process of purging, pruning, and tearing away. We have no control. We know not what God is doing, nor how he's going to do it. But all that he requires of us in that process is that we submitly, submittedly yield to him and allow him to do the work in us that he has started. The word of God says in Ecclesiastes chapter three, verses one through eight, to everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. When you have time, go back and read these these couple of verses so you can understand the timing and the seasons of God and what takes place. God doesn't tell us ahead of time what he's doing. Most often we travel on a dark journey where we have to completely depend on God to walk us through step by step until we reach that final destination. Some of us often make decisions and choices and plans for our lives based upon what we want to do, how we want to live, and where we see ourselves down the road. There are some times where we selfishly make these decisions without diligently consulting God about what choices to make or what paths that we should take. And sometimes we don't even ask him what his perfect will is for our lives which means that we often make choices without waiting on God's answer. We write our five year, 10 year and 15 plans. And this is good. This is a good thing because God told us in the back of two and two to write the vision and make it plain. However, God still can intercept your plans to fulfill his at any given time. And that you have no control over either. Know that what God wants, he wants his best for you. Despite what you're going through, he still wants his best for you. Remember, there's a pur purging, a pruning, a burning, and a tearing away. That's a process that we must go through. But I want to leave you with this thought. I want you to know that the way you carry your heart through transition will determine how effective you are in the promised land. So watch how you carry your heart. And when I say watch how you carry your heart, if you've got to get on your knees every day in repentance and prayer, 
that God will purify your heart so that your heart can be clean to the point to where your heart, what's in your heart won't be a hindrance to where he's trying to take you. That your heart won't be a hindrance to who God has, is going to, who he has or is going to place in your life to minister to. Because we want our lives and our ministry to be effective. Whether our ministry is in the marketplace or whether it's in, it's in, it's in the church, on our job, we have to make sure that our hearts, what's in our heart is in the right place. I want to give you 10 quick steps to recover from failing marriages, fractured friendships, and wounded fellowship. Number one, do not hesitate to ask for help. Don't bottle up your feelings and pretend that you're okay, especially when you know that you're not. Help someone else that you are doing your time of grief. Support them in their difficult time. Surround yourself with family and friends who love you. And especially surround yourself for those to those that are willing. They got to be willing to help you get to get to get your feet back on solid ground. If you need to go to counseling, go see a therapist. You don't know how crucial and critical that is to your healing process. It's beneficial. Number two, declutter. Declutter your mind and declutter your surroundings. Tidy up things. Throw things out that you don't need. To make sure that your mind has a way, has an opportunity to think clearly. Because when you're going through trauma, when you're going through pain and grief, your mind can get cluttered and clouded. Decluttering will help with that. Number three, keep yourself busy. Don't just be busy just doing stuff. But take time to recover from the emotional trauma that you're going through. To prevent yourself from dwelling on those painful memories, keep yourself busy doing constructive things. Spend time with your family. Focus on a hobby. Go out and socialize. That is so important. A lot of times when we're going through trauma, we want to just sit in the, in the house because we don't feel like being bothered. We don't, sometimes we're going through depression and we don't want people to see us going through that transition. But it's necessary that you get out of those four walls because the longer you stay in there, the more depressed you're going to be. The more difficult it's going to be to get out. Force yourself to get out and go interact socially. Go to the grocery store just to be around people. Even if you don't want to buy nothing, go walk around. Go outside. Take a walk in the park. Get out of the house. It, it's something about being in the sun that transforms you internally. Keep yourself busy. And four, find yourself again. Find yourself again. Find out what you like, what you, what you enjoy, and do those things. Do those things that you really want to do just for you. Number five, take time to travel. Even if you can't go out of the country or go to another state, go find a hotel in the city which you, where you live in an area you've never been before and get yourself into a new atmosphere. Number six, give it time. Give what you're going through time to work itself out. Give God time to mend it and pull it back together. And if again, if it's not if it's not repairable, give yourself time to heal after you've let go. Number seven, things happen for a reason. Everything happens for a reason. You may not understand it now, but someday you will look back on this experience and you will realize why it had to happen. You don't understand it now, but you will a little bit later. Number eight, find your focus. This is your opportunity to cry out to God and give him your wounded heart. Don't try to fix yourself. Don't try to work it out for yourself because you don't know what to do. God knows what's best for you, for each and every one of us. Give him the time and the opportunity to work it out and do what you can. not He'll fix it and make it better in a greater and a better way than you ever could. Number nine, forgive. As painful as it is, forgive. You may not feel it right away, but speak it out of your mouth. I forgive so-and-so for what they for doing this to me. I forgive so-and-so for saying this to me. I forgive myself. Forgiving ourselves is the hardest thing that we could ever do. We make wrong choices and wrong decisions. We say things unconsciously knowing that it's going to hurt people or affect them in a negative way. So many things we do that we are not proud of. 
even within ourselves, about ourselves. But not only, don't only forgive other people for the offenses that they've done towards you. Forgive yourself for decisions and things that you've made that cause your own self hurt and pain. And then number 10, don't close the door to love. If your failing marriage is not working out, don't close your heart out to love. For number one, God still loves you. Your family still loves you. And God still has people that he's going to bring into your life that's going to genuinely love you for who you are. Not for what you are, what you can do, but for who you are. Don't close yourself off for love. Don't allow your fears to prevent you from finding happiness in your life again. Happiness is not, your happiness is not dependent upon other people, but your happiness is dependent upon the love of God that you allow to enter into your heart and penetrate your mind and soul. And that happiness will burst forth from within you. I pray that there was something that was said that blessed your heart. I know this is a lengthy video, but I think that it is well needed and pertinent in this time that we're living in. I pray that you have taken time to watch it all the way through. And if you have, I salute you and I say thank you so much for taking time to listen to what God has placed on my heart to minister to you. May God bless you and keep you is my prayer. May the perfect work of the living God continue to be perfected and worked out in your life. Let God in and let him do a new, a, a new thing in you. And that is my prayer. Give God your whole heart in the process and watch him turn things around in your life and do things for you that you never thought could be done. May God bless you. May he keep you is my prayer. Because the, 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 the video is so long, I'm not going to take additional time to pray for you on this video. But I promise you, I will get on my knees and pray for each and every viewer that takes time to watch this. As well as though, and do this for me, please, 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 please do this for me. <clears throat> I want this word to get out all over. You know why? Because there's hurting people all over the world. There's hurting people that don't know that there's a Jesus that loves them, that sacrificed his life and shed his blood for their, for their sins, their transgressions, and for their pain. Share the video. Please, share with somebody that you know that can be used, that can be encouraged by the words that's been spoken. And as you share it, I pray that God blesses you in abundance. In Jesus' name, may God bless you. Until next week, you have a great weekend and a spectacular week ahead.